uh, thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. My pleasure. So I'm watching TV last year, end of the season, Yankee Stadium, and there is Sharon Robinson, Rachel Robinson, Mariano Rivera, you're out at the monument, yeah. and they are retiring his uniform yeah. and also acknowledging your dad. Right. Mariano Rivera, uniform number retired throughout baseball in 1997. Mo is considered the greatest closure in baseball history. He spent his entire career in pinstripes from 1995 to 2013 and became the franchise leader in games pitch. Thriving under pressure, he amassed the most saves in postseason history. A 13-time All-Star, he retired as baseball's all-time saves leader but this was absolutely incredible. It just showed the love that baseball had for the man because uh, the teams, he got another rocking chair from another team and you know the, his teammates brought him things, but it was the, like throughout um, all the clubs, they, they really respected and loved Mariano Rivera. So, and it was um, incredible to be there with his family. He's got this, uh, his wife is a minister and uh, there's a very supportive family. Um, and the Yankees went all out. So it was just an incredible day. Perfect. Couldn't have been a, a more yeah, beautiful day. He's always about how proud he is to have been the last one to wear the number. Um, and he wore it well and is very proud of the, the connection to Jackie Robinson. But more, even more than that, he, he brought such uh, class and, and strength to the number. So it, it just en it, it enhanced an already powerful number. The Mets and the Dodgers coming up on Jackie Robinson night. How much advance notice did you get of that? Did you know that, that day or really? the day before? And we didn't know. They, uh, we got a call saying it was going to happen. And um, Mom and I looked at each other. Was like, is this a good idea? You know, we sort of wanted to f see how the fans felt about it because we'd always liked the fact that there were players that wore number forty-two. So, you know, uh, but then we got to to Shea Stadium, and my mom's out on the field with uh, the Commissioner Selig and. Um, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, and when when Commissioner Silik made the announcement, the fans just jumped out of their seats, and that was like, oh, it was the right decision. So you know, it was very very proud moment, um, very historic moment, and it was we were happy we were with at Chase Stadium with the Mets. It was the right place for it to happen. Welcome to the second game of the 1972 World Series. It, 25th, it was his 25th anniversary of breaking the color barrier, and he told us that we were going to go as a family. It was also, it was, I didn't know it was near the end of my dad's life, or, or very near the end of my dad's life, but I knew he was quite sick. So um, being at the stadium where they're honoring him for the 25th, and now I'm old enough to take it in, um, I wanted to know what it was like, and so we did. We were up in our our seats in the stands, waiting before the ceremony, and asking him question after question, and he answered. And it, it wasn't like my dad was reticent to answer; it was just like we hadn't asked him these questions before. So it was quite um, quite a moment, and then. It was even more special because my dad chose that moment to not just say thank you and to take his honors, but once again to say, you know, it's great uh, that 25 years later, you know, the field is integrated, but we still don't see any, any African American, any black people in management. I'm proud and pleased to be here this afternoon, but must admit I'm going to be tremendously more pleased and more proud. When I look at that third base coaching line one day and see a black face managing in baseball. Thank you very much. Surprise, I think, was the way he told it back to us that without any, that it didn't, he didn't tell it back in a painful way. And I think my fear all those years, because I'd seen the Jackie Robinson story when I was a young girl, so my fear was that it was, it was such a hurtful thing to him that he would remember it with pain, and I didn't get that from his playback. Um, it was, you know, factual, it was um, happy to share, 
um, but not that this was the worst thing that happened to me in life, or this was a hard, even though he didn't even go into that it was the most difficult thing he ever had accomplished, because he really felt that his most difficult challenge was his diabetes. You know, it was something he had no control over, or, or limited control over. And where you uh, said, was he lonely? Yeah. But, but it wasn't just on the field, it was, you know, like the traveling and all of that. But again, um, my dad is a, so, so inside of himself, you know, or, or so, he was able to deal with it in, in, in ways that probably would have been harder for people that were more, more social. My dad wasn't all that social anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so for him, it was his work, it was his job, he was going to get it done, and he, was gonna, he didn't know how long he was going to stay in baseball or how long he'd be in baseball, because he already started off much older than most of the other guys, uh, the guys that were ending their career. He was like just starting at that point, so. Great respect. Um, they were partners initially, and they did some marches together. Um, then we, as a family, our first big thing was the March on Washington, and then after that, um, um, my parents hosted a jazz concert to raise money for Dr. King, um, actually for his organization and for specifically for um, bail money for the jailed civil rights workers. So they had honorary degrees together. They didn't come to a difference until it came to the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and at that point, it was my father had a uh, son who had, was in the war, and he was speaking out as a father, or, you know, wanted the soldiers to feel they, that they had it, that they were there for a reason. And Dr. King, you know, was, uh, um, you know, wanted us to come out of the war, which, you know, both men were correct. So that was their first sort of, and I, and I think it's unfortunate that they even had to have a public discussion about that. Um, I personally wish they could have talked about it, you know, quietly and, and, and just not even had any, not shared their difference on it. But, you know, my father was a, always very vocal, and as was Dr. King, so. Um, he was a very southern, bo you know, southern boy kind of feel, uh, very friendly and warm, uh, very gracious, very um, happy to come to our house and, and meet all of us and, and to um, have my parents raise the money for him. So it was, it was a very, it was a, it was a positive experience. We had grown up around people that I guess you would consider celebrities, you know, and they didn't, we didn't make a big deal out of it, but we knew this man was special. So on, a, on this rainy day, we come in, and there's no preparation for this, and I had never seen the Jackie Robinson story before, and I didn't know about the early years of my father in baseball. My parents really protected us from that. And we come in there, and the wheel starts rolling, and and they show that Jackie Robinson, and my own father comes up on the screen, and I'm in this room, and I don't, I'm mortified, and... And of course, you know, especially when I have to sort of see racism. It was my first time also having a visual of racism, and I have to see the, the name calling and and the um, you know the backlash for him entering baseball. And I was like, I didn't know what that meant to my world. I was like, just told you know, turned my world upside down. So that was uh, my first challenge, and I was so. I was so confused by it that instead of, I didn't go home and say, Mom, what was that about? You know, Dad, tell me about this. I just like sort of put it in the back of my mind and went home and didn't, you know, didn't have them explain. So it, it really took years for me to understand that um, the 1973 moment, um, 72 uh, game, is so important because that's, that's sort of the, block, the beginning of my understanding of that period and what my father contributed to to race relations and, and uh, American history. Um, and, and that whole process continued and continues today because I'm always learning something new. Well, you've been great. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Want to try to get you a picture? Okay. Like me. <laughs> Robinson, thank you. Thank you. We'll also see you tomorrow at the Yeah. April 15th will forever be recognized as Jackie Robinson Day throughout Major League Baseball, ensuring that the incredible contributions and sacrifices he made for baseball, and more importantly, society, would never be forgotten. The last active player to wear number 42 
as we all will remember, is Mariano Rivera, who just retired last year as a New York Yankee. And I want to give her a special thanks for coming up to see us in February. <laughs> Sharon herself is an accomplished author and has written several books about her father. She also enjoys spending time with her family, writing, traveling for speaking engagements, and working closely with the Jackie Robinson Foundation. She is the educational consultant for Major League Baseball, where she helps encourage students to overcome obstacles in their lives, just like her father did. Prior to joining Major League Baseball, she had a 20-year career as a nurse and a midwife and an educator. And I can tell you, after sitting with her and visiting with her this evening, she is one special lady. As she comes to the microphone, please give her a warm Chautauqua County welcome, Sharon Robinson. I had no idea what I was coming to tonight. Um, such a special evening. Randy Chip, I, I understand now, Chip, why you've been doing this for 20 years. I can imagine you getting sucked in every year and saying, I'm not doing it next year, but uh, then you have a night like tonight and it's hard not to repeat. Um, Geez, where to begin? You know, after everybody spoke, I was like, I wanted to tell the father who had to be away from his family so much that his children do appreciate him and love him and there's no reason to feel guilty. Um, the son who wore a size 12 shoe and his father wore a size 15. Um, don't even try to compare yourself. When people used to do that to me, I say, oh yeah, but my dad couldn't deliver any babies. <laughs> so you have to find a way to Stand tall in your own shoes. To the wives, um, that was really, really touching. Uh, Dan's wife and Jack's wife and the other wives. I think of my mother. She was um, very proud to be Mrs. Jackie Robinson, but she fought really hard to be Rachel Robinson as well. And luckily she did, because my father died when she was quite young. And uh, so the Rachel Robinson is, became an extraordinary woman on her own, but still remained very attached to Jackie Robinson and proud of being his wife, his, wife, his widow. But my family, like all of your families, um, we had multiple things that we had to do. Um, I rem I, my father retired from Major League Baseball in 1956. It was after the 56 season. He had played 10 years in the Dodger organization and he wanted to go out a Dodger. So who was it that went to the Giants? Somebody went to the Giants. Well, they tried to send my father to the Giants at the end of his 10 years and he told them he would give it his best shot and I, I always loved this about my dad, you know? He's like, he liked to um, sort of play it off. It sort of reminds me of when he would know he, he had it. He, he know he was gonna steal home successfully. You could see it in his movements and his face. I mean, there was a, there's a great uh, scene of my father literally clapping his hands and jumping in the air, you know, when he knew he had, had that, he was, gonna, he was gonna steal home and he was gonna get that picture. My father was traded 
to our team that, I'm trying to say it a nice way, it's a terrible thing to say you hated another team. Our, it, it, it wasn't even like a rivalry, because the Yankees and the Dodgers had a rivalry. The, the Dodgers and the New York Giants, you know, it wasn't even a rivalry, it was a real <laughs> battle, put it, I'll say it nicely. So my father was traded to the Giants. So that's the biggest insult you can do to a former Dodger, so especially someone that had given so much to the Dodger organization. So when he gets his call, he says, oh, f fine, I'll give it my best shot. And he, my dad was almost thir it was in his late 30s, so he knew he, it was time for him to retire anyway. So he went forward with his plans to retire. He accepted a job with, job with Chalk Full of Nuts, and he signed a contract with Life Magazine to tell his story. So instead of, in January, calling a press conference, as all of you athletes know, that's the, the way to go, um, Life Magazine re has a big story where Jackie Robinson announces his retirement. Uh, and it was, in fact, one of the sports rep reporters said, Jackie Robinson retires from Major League Baseball with the same rhubarb as when he came in. Um, but my dad always wanted to do, um, you know, to be in control of his life. So when he retired from Major League Baseball, um, we thought that we were going to have him home all the time. But he took a job in New York City, and then he started traveling for the Civil Rights Movement. So he was still sort of in and out of our lives. And he was in, entering a world that we didn't understand because he was traveling down in the deep south and there, we always saw was on television were hoses and dogs and marches and um, violence. And we worried about our dad. So one time he came back from one of those marches having met Dr. King. And he came, we had dinner together as a family. It was um, a family tradition in my house. And my father was, whenever he was home, you know, we sat down together. And my dad was somewhat patient with us in our day, daily activities, but really he wanted to talk, he always wanted to have a discussion. You know, he wanted to talk about what was going on in the world. So he came home this time and he said, well, I've been, all these years, I, for the past few years, I've been traveling down south and coming back and telling you stories about what's going on down there. And he said, and you've been up here in the north, and my brothers and I were integrating our schools. As a family, we had integrated our neighborhood. And he said, um, I hope that you will find work that you love, and family will always be important. And for my dad, God was, and prayer, were right up there, you know, in terms of importance, at the top of the list. And that was sort of understood. But he said, as a family, we're going to have a family mission and a family and build a family legacy. And so in 1963, he said, our first thing we were going to do is go to the March on Washington. So we, my mom and I, my, my two brothers and my dad went down to Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington. And we have wonderful photos of my mother, my father and my younger brother, David. There's none of Jackie. And my mother and I are sort of absent because it was a very hot day and there were a lot of people and I was 13 and I fainted. So my mother and I spent time in the medical tent. Um, but it didn't matter. We, you know, I was fine in time for the I have a dream speech. And it was our, but it was our first time, you know, my father was just so thrilled to have his whole family there with him on that march. So we came back home and our next thing was my dad told us that we were gonna have a jazz concert at our house to raise money for Dr. King. And what, he gave all of us assignments. So my brothers and I had to clean up our rooms because they were gonna be the changing rooms and that's, you know, a major deal. And then we sold hot dogs and soda and my brother Jackie helped my father park cars. And my father was very intent on him being the one that parked the cars, not necessarily so he could greet everybody, but so he could protect his lawn. 
<laughs> we lived on six acres and we took care of our own property. Um, and my dad, the lawn was his baby. So he wanted to make sure nobody parked on, on his grass and they could park over in the stumps as we used to call it. But it started um, a family tradition of having jazz concerts to raise money for organizations. And Dr. King actually came to our house and we, we raised you know, some money for him to take back. And we, then we continued to do this throughout my dad's life. But tonight, I, I listened to you all and I was like, you know, it sort of reminded me of my family because you are a larger family who have embraced your members and because of that you've been very successful. I mean these young people that came across here tonight, you know, they, they know they're in a community that supports them both as athletes and as people and hopefully as good students as well, because most of them were talking about either they were in college or they're going to college. So you've done this amazing job, and part of it is because you, they've seen how you, it's multi-generational. You embrace the young people and you embrace the older people that have made contributions to the community. And it just made me feel like, you know, you are so lucky as a community. Um, so I am, I feel blessed to have been just part of this because I know what you're going to continue to, to produce and I, and I wish all we could see this across the country, um, communities coming together and uh, supporting their young and their old um, and making them feel valuable and loved and, and appreciated. So I have this book called Jackie Stein. My, my son, he had uh, multiple learning disabilities. He was a high school football player, um, all-American football player, you know, very good. But I, and he loved to work with me on my books. I would, in fact, I was working on uh, I would, a novel series um, is a, about a character, and the character is a young black boy in New York who's come from Connecticut. And I called my editor one day, or my editor called me, asked me how is the, you know, the rewrite going, and I said, oh, I was going fine, but I was just calling my son to talk about the ending. And she said to me, I'm your editor. Why are you calling my son, your son? I'm like, because he's my source. He's been my source on all of my books, and especially if I'm talking about a young kid um, and, and survival. Um, so she was, she didn't get it necessarily, but Jackie's not, I, and my, my son, since he didn't like to read, he would help me with all my books, but he wouldn't like to read them. He'd read like a chapter and considered that he had covered the book. Um, <laughs> But he loved Jackie's Nine, and that's part of why I wanted to write it. It's short stories um, about his grandfather, about Jackie Robinson. There's stories about me in it. And then there's a, each one of the values, there is a story about an individual um, who had, did something in his life that where that value was very important to him, so, and, and helped them through. Jackie's Nine was one of my first books for kids, um, but it's not a book for kids. It's um, all adult writing, so both, all ages enjoy this book or, or, lear or, or learn from it. So I was thrilled to hear when Chip told me that they've been re kids have been reading it across New York State. I was like, really? I mean, so that was part of that fog. I don't, I, I'm sure we discussed this a while ago, but I, I didn't remember it. But How Jackie's Nine, it's interesting being an author. Um, you, an author can take a book to a publisher and they can even agree to do the book and you can work on the book you've agreed on and then all of a sudden, everyone gets together and says, we need to do a different book. And that's exactly how Jackie's Nine happened. 
these nine values are values that I, that I use in a program um, we do with Major League Baseball called Breaking Barriers in Sports and Life. And it started in 1997. I was traveling, um, I was working as a midwife, but I was going to ballparks to throw out the first pitch um, during, when they were celebrating my dad's 50th anniversary. And the media kept saying it's just, just about celebrations in ballparks. And I kept saying it can't be because my parents were very involved in giving back and my dad was particularly like working with young people. And I said it enough to I finally said, well, maybe I should do something about it because my son was graduating from high school. I could now have a job where I traveled. So I approached Major League Baseball and I came with, for a lunch meeting with all this list of things that I thought I could do for baseball. And it was a bit of a, a challenge because I was coming from a nursing background, a midwifery background, and a teaching background. And so they said no to everything I suggested. So I said, fine, I have a job, and we just went on eating lunch. And I said, well, you know, last week I was at a school, and I, if I go to school, a school to talk about my dad, I talk about his character. Because I feel like that's something that all, that this generation and future generations can grab onto. So they said, great, you can do that for baseball. And that's exactly how a program that is now in its 17th year got started. Um, breaking Barriers, the concept is whether you're a 10 year old or a major league baseball player, you have obstacles that you have to overcome in your life uh, or barriers. So we teach kids what different types of barriers and then we give them values that I associate with my dad's success on and off the field as strategies to overcome their own personal obstacles. And then students have to put that together um, through a, a, a national essay contest where they write about a barrier or obstacle they've had to overcome in their lives and they have to talk about how one of these nine values has helped them get to the next level. So the first thing the kids would ask me when I go into school was, did your dad put these values up on the refrigerator? And I said, no, I, I just observed him and my mother and I learned from them and from that I, I wrote the values that I had seen them put into action. So to give you an example of a couple of the kids that I've met over the past 17 years, I have a young girl out of Cincinnati. Her name is Maggie Zanis, and Maggie wrote about being born with a rare neurological condition where she feels no pain. And she described how she'd been, in 14 years, she'd had 14 surgeries, and uh, she can't focus on what she can't do, but really has to has to push forward on with what she can do. She's a huge baseball fan, a baseball historian, and she can write. So she began to have a blog. She has a blog about baseball, mostly about Cincinnati Reds. Um, she was on other writing, um, you know, school newspaper and all, you know, and different kinds of writing activities. So when I go to meet, when I, we select the winners, I go out and I actually meet the kids in their schools and take them over to a ballpark. Um, and the grand prize winner joins me at the all-star game and they're presented during a, the pregame ceremony. So I meet Maggie, very impressed with her, can't get her out of my mind. Um, and then I see her again at the all-star game. So I'll give you another example of, of Maggie's personality. She said to me, um, she told me, she said, well, when I was nine, I dressed up as Pete Rose for Halloween. So when I finally took her to meet the commissioner at the World Series game, and I had to bring her up to his, her suite, the commissioner's suite, and the commissioner is saying to me, I go up and I tell him about Maggie, and he's already going, oh my God, and I'm like, don't do that, because you'd be so impressed with her, you, you know, she doesn't want you to feel sorry for her. And so I bring her in, and I, as I'm bringing her in, she says to me, oh, by the way, can I bring up Pete Rose? So I said, you know, Maggie, that's a sensitive subject, but I'll leave it up to you. So I bring Maggie in, and she and the commissioner just, next thing I know, I mean, they're just locked in conversation. I mean, they, he's not paying attention to any of his other guests in the suite. It's just he and Maggie having this very intense discussion. And uh, at the end, I, I said to her, so did you bring it up? And she said, yep. Um, but Maggie, the next day, the commissioner called and he said, um, I couldn't get Maggie out of my mind. And so Maggie is now a youth reporter for MLB.com. Yeah. And she has full credentials. Um, she 
uh, mostly covers the Cincinnati Reds, and they try to make sure she's, uh, you know, working with her school schedule so she can get it done. Um, but she's, you know, just an incredi incredible young woman uh, who still has a, a re really big struggle. She, when I met her, she had absolutely no friends. So her friends now have been friends that she's met through baseball. Some of them are young, but most of them are older. Um, so she still has personal struggles, and she, she and I had a long talk about it recently. So it's not like we're saying that, you know, you write this essay and describe what's going on with you and things go away, but these kids that, that I've met over the 17 years are really, have very powerful stories, but they also are, are continuing in their journey. I had one other little boy that I, I want to share with you. He, uh, he was born with uh, cystic fibrosis, and he was told he couldn't uh, ride a bike without training wheels. And he said to his mother, I want to ride my bike you know, without training wheels. And so for two years, um, his mother and Luke, his name was Luke, they went up on a grassy hill and they practiced him riding a bike without training wheels. But it took him two years to do this. And finally, he was able to ride a bike without training wheels. So when he wrote his essay, he talked about, you know, this experience, but he also talked about jump roping. And he said he couldn't jump rope. So he kept practicing and he kept practicing, and he finally got up to doing it 52 times. So Luke, um, who was, whose father at the time was in the, the Army, we were at West Point, he stands up in front of his group, the host sixth grade, and reads his essay, and he stops when he gets to the jump roping part, and he says, I'm now up to 67 times. <laughs> so, you know, the, again, family, you know, and community. Um, I, I have been really blessed because I had this incredible 20 years as a nurse midwife, and then I work for Major League Baseball, and I do. I'm able to do work that is, um, you know, absolutely incredible. And I feel like it's an extension of midwifery. And it goes right back to what I learned from my father when I was 13, and that is, you know, we got to have our, our family's got got to stay a priority, find work that we love, and also have a family mission. So I could tell tonight that you not, you not only have a family mission, but you also have a community mission. And I thank you for allowing me to be, be, be a part of it. Jackie, we can't thank you. Jackie. Sharon, we can't thank you enough for being with us. As a token of our appreciation, I would like to present this specially made bat. It comes from the Superior Bat Company here in Jamestown. It's Dodger Blue, the number 42, and it says, Thank you, Sharon, Chautauqua Sports Hall of Fame, February 17th, 2014. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Can I have Reverend Ferguson come up, please, and give us the final benediction? benevolent, the most welcoming, uh, the most loving communities I've ever lived in my life. And um, while I'm kind of a nobody, really, in this community, I think that it's safe for me to say that we uh, embrace you as part of our Chautauqua County family. Thank you very much for coming up. Could you join me as we close in prayer? Father God, we have just as we said earlier, been surrounded by great achievements tonight. Great achievements performed by ordinary people who, because they utilized the, the wonderful gifts that you bestowed upon them, achieved greatness and continue to achieve greatness. And Lord, even though we have focused tonight on achievements that happen on the context of a playing field, May our achievements go far beyond the playing field, that we can have deep influence and make a difference in this world in which you have placed us. And we thank you for that opportunity, and we pray this again in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you one and all again for attending.
And I leave you with these words. Keep your smiles right side up and keep reaching for the stars. God bless.